Anyway, who am I? I am Michael Castaval. I'm also known as Foss Firefighter or End Commander. Uh, I've been a fellow for ICANN um, at ICANN 63 and ICANN 65. I'm a member of the new GTL subsequent uh, policies procedure, and I have an interest in DNSSEC, internationalized domain names, email address, internet uh, actualization, and other security issues. I uh, w was an alumni of Canonical for six years and developing Ubuntu Linux, and I've done extensive work with Web PKI, that is uh, SSL certificates and uh, TLS, DNSSEC, and attacks on those protocols. I work as an independent freelancer and researcher, and my Twitter and GitHub are here, as well as my IRC information. So to begin this talk, let's talk about what DNS actually is. Now, I'm guessing a fair number of you are familiar with it, but uh, if you're from a certain age, you may remember these, or at least in the United States. But in short, DNS is short for the domain name system. It's a core internet protocol that converts um, IP addresses to names and back, like google.com, twitter.com. Or uh, without, we'd be stuck remembering IP addresses instead of um, names. DNS is one of the oldest protocols still in use in the internet, and uh, it does show. The modern incarnation that we used today was standardized in 1987, um, and it's hierarchical in nature, with all entries stemming from a single root zone, which is managed by ICANN. Uh, and it was one of the first uh, mostly decentralized protocols on the internet. So DNS addresses are like phone numbers. Um, if you take a typical phone number like 1201 555 uh, DNS works pretty much the same way. In this case, one is the uh, uh, international dialing prefix. One is the country code, the United States in this case. 201 is an area code. 555 is the exchange, 1212 is the subscriber name. DNS addresses work the same way. So here's an example of DNS name, dnstalk.defcon201.org. Unlike phone numbers, they are processed right to left. So you start with or um, the dot at the end, which represents the internet root zone, uh, or org, which is the top level domain, uh, defcon201, which is the second level domain, and DNS talk uh, is the third level domain. So the system is hierarchical, and it all works through a system known as delegation, where one server points to another, points to another. And uh, this is handled by a process known, um, is handled by a server known as a recursive resolver, which we'll talk more about in a moment. So DNS uh, is for mo generally consists of zone files, and they consist of um, various records. For example, here is an example.com on which has a quad a text and MX records. And I'll explain what these are in a moment. So the, generally when you're dealing with DNS, these are some of the most common ones. You will always have what's known as a statement of authority. It basically details what is known as authoritative data or information that a given server is the authoritative source of information for instead of it just being relayed by other servers. A and quad A represent IPv4 and IPv6 hosts. MX handles is mail exchange, um, which is used for SMTP for incoming mail. Text records are, as the name suggests, arbitrary text strings, but they are used for some things such as SPF uh, policies. We also have CNAME, which are aliases. NS, which is a name server record, it points to the next server in delegation. Uh, PTR or pointer, which is a reverse lookup. And CAA, which is Certificate Authority Authorization. And it's a uh, recently, uh, recently added record uh, that says what CAs are allowed to sign for this domain. So <clears throat> now uh, let's walk through a DNS. Um, look up in practice so we can see how the system of delegation works and then we'll start going into the flaws and security issues with DNS. So as I mentioned before, we need to start at the root zone and work down. So let's start by the process of getting the A record for defcon201.org from Cloudflare's 1.1.1.1 resolver and then see how it chains all the way down. So the first step, um, you know, if you ask a recursive resolver it will basically do uh, just tell you DEFCON 201 has this IP address, you're done. But what's happening behind the scenes is a little bit more complicated. So the recursive resolver, assuming it doesn't have any information cache, 
will go to the uh, internet root zones. And these are hard coded in DNS servers. If you look in bind, there's a list of all the DNS uh, root servers in it. And from there, it'll request the org top level domain and get a list of all the delegations for it. Stepping down, it will get um, the org domain will say which servers are managing the DEFCON 201 domain. And then if I ask that sort of directly, I get what's known as an authoritative answer, which we saw before. And that's what the recursive resolver does behind the scenes. Uh, normally the, end, the client system or the end user never talks to the root servers or any of the intermediary servers in the chain. The problem um, is that as a protocol built in 1987, uh, security was not exactly at the forefront when they designed DNS. Um, the first and most obvious problem is that DNS traffic is simply not encrypted. Um, if, uh, if you've got a Wireshark running on a network, you can see every single DNS request made, even if uh, a client's connecting to a service that's using secure sockets. Um, furthermore, DNS servers can lie. Um, for example, here in the United States, both Verizon and Spectrum, if you type in a domain name that doesn't exist, it um, redirects you to a fake search results page instead of the uh, non-existent domain uh, error that should have been set. This uh, wrecks havoc with software that expects your DNS servers to you know, actually work the way they're supposed to. Um, basically, hijacking DNS is pretty straightforward. Um, there's multiple ways this can be done. Uh, the two most common are man in the middle attacks and DNS cache poisoning. Also, because DNS works over UDP, it is possible if an attacker controls layer two of the network to simply just do packet injection and simply return false requests. So covering uh, cache poisoning, um, the concept here is that to prevent repeated load on DNS servers, um, all records are cached for a certain time known as the time to live which is set globally in the SOA record or can also be set on a per record basis. Um, if, the high, if an attacker can manipulate responses from an upstream DNS server via, so say, BGP hijacking, packet injection, uh, they can cause recursive resolvers to cache invalid information and reconnect clients to another target. DNSSEC was uh, primarily designed to combat cache poisoning attacks by making DNS records authenticated, but it has some critical flaws that we're going to get into in a moment. Um, specifically, the two major problems is that DNSSEC still has very low deployment on the global internet due to it being rather difficult to deploy and not well supported by many tools. I mean, unless you're running your own authoritative name servers, most, um, most ISPs and uh, domain hosting services do not have mechanisms for DNSSEC signing your zones. Even when DNSSEC is deployed, it is vulnerable to stripping attacks and denial of service attacks. Uh, because of the way it works, which I will talk more in depth, you can't do DNS valid DNSSEC validation over TCP uh, over UDP. It has to be done over TCP IP. And if you can block those connections by forcing the reset, uh, you can force a downgrade attack and not get signed information. It's also possible um, if you are manipulating traffic that you can simply, I believe, yeah, sorry, I have this on the next slide. Um, it's also prone to stripping attacks. There is no standard that says that DNS records should be signed. Um, although currently DNS resolvers can assume the root zone is signed, but that is pretty much the exception. And, um, it's possible for an attacker to simply delete what are known as the DS and R SIG records in flight and they, uh, by doing so, it makes the signed zone appear unsigned and thus um, vulnerable to manipulation. Furthermore, uh, DNSSEC does not cover the NS delegation, which I showed before, which can allow for side channel attacks, even without stripping DNSSEC data, because you can force an, um, a resolver to connect to your name servers instead of the correct name servers uh, and replay old information. 
And finally, and perhaps the most damning bit, is DNS sex does not extend, extend to the last mile. The client never sees signed DNS records directly. It's entirely dependent on the recursive resolver. Um, to the client, it's actually a single bit field in the DNS option flags. Um, and there is no local validation of DNSSEC information. So as I previously talked about, it's also possible that a server just flat out lies. This can be um, by an ISP. This can be by hijacking port 53 traffic. Um, but basically, you can grab all the traffic going to a DNS server and then return whatever results you want. And for the most part, the uh, victim machine is simply going to accept that because there is no other authentication method. So there have been efforts to bring DNS, uh, bring security to DNS. Now I've talked about DNS SAC, which let's, we're gonna break into a little more details. It's currently the most deployed security system in the wild, but it's extremely complex and it doesn't solve the last mile. And um, as other DNS security measures are built on top of DNSSEC, it's kind of important to understand how it works. So a little bit of terminology for this. Um, KSK is what's known as a key signing key. It's basically the equivalent of a private key or master key for a given zone. The ZSK or zone signing key is a sub key that is used to sign a zone. It is optional, but um, it allows for certain types of revocation or being able to keep the KSK offline. And what's also finally known as a RR set, which is a resource record set, it's a collective uh, whole of a given record type, uh, like all the A records for a given zone or the quad A records. So the NSSEC works for, by forming a signed chain of trust from the internet root zone to each endpoint through a system known as designated signers. Those are the DS records I talked about. The root zone was signed in 2010, and most of the top level domains are now signed, making real world deployment possible. Uh, DNSSEC was primarily implemented by adding new resource types to DNS containing signing data and information. Uh, specifically, it added what's known as RRSIG, which is the resource record signature. It's basically a um, signed hash of the um, RR set records. You have DNS key, which has the public key of a given zone. DS, that's designated designer, it holds the public key for the next zone in the delegation chain. Um, and we have NSEC and NSEC3, which is next secure record. It affirms that domain does not exist by signed reply. This is to prevent um, faking NX domain messages. Um, I'm just gonna take a moment here. Uh, is there any questions? Are people following along? Uh, can you hear us? Uh, it's a little soft, but yes. Okay, so if there are any questions, ask them and we'll replay them. All right, all right, I'll carry on. So trust in DNSSEC is established from a hard-coded KSK. Uh, for those who've been following the news, the root zone key was recently rolled over uh, two or three months ago to a new key generated in 2017. Mm -hmm. Uh, that key is hard-coded into recursive resolvers, uh, and there has been work at the IETF to have a more streamlined way of changing that key in the future. The root zone then publishes its own DNS key, which is the has the public um, and the D, uh, which is the public key, and the DS records for top-level domains, which uh, are then signed by their own private keys. So basically, the top-level domain is signed by a hard-coded key then it has a list of the public keys going down to the next layer and so forth and so on. Um, and then there's just one level of DS records going on, going forth. So we're going to walk through a signed DNS zone, which I'll hopefully explain this, I'll hopefully show this a bit clearer. This is for a, a website I own, soilentnews.org. So I've in this example, I had dig to uh, include DNSSEC data. So this is similar to the calls we saw earlier, but in addition to the name server records, we also get the DS records, which are the public keys for the .org zone, and we get an RRSIG uh, for those keys, which base, which indicate, which um, has been signed by the private key. 
uh, creating the first link of trust. Notice that there's no RR sig for the NS um, records. That is by design in DNSSEC. Um, the reason that the NS records aren't signed is that you can verify the next level by comparing the DS record from the root zone to the DNS key of the next zone. Um, in practice, that opens up a small security hole, but um, it would make the packets even larger, and the NSSEC is already a fairly noisy protocol as is. So let's keep going down the chain. So if we now ask the .org zone for soilentnews.org and we want a signed reply, we would get the soilentnews.org public keys in DS and then we get a signed, uh, an, uh, signed RR sig by the .org public key. Uh, and then you can follow this along to get the A records, which are signed by our private keys from our name servers. And then you can do uh, what's known as walking the chain with dig. And it basically validates the entire um, chain from the root downward to uh, show that it's found verified keys from the root to the org to soil news and so forth and so on. So DNSSEC does provide one very useful functionality. It does provide a way to get a forward of sign information for DNS. So if you know that you're not having your DNS records tampered with, you can be, and the zone you're accessing is signed, it does provide validation and security that those records are correct. The problem is that you have to trust your cursive resolver. Um, it's also impossible to send uh, invalid RSIG records unless an attacker has the private keys. But as I mentioned before, it's a system with some pretty heavy flaws. Um, beyond what I've already mentioned, uh, DNSSEC requires that all domains manually sign their zones. It's not something that can just be globally rolled out you know, to the internet with the flip of a switch. Each and every domain owner needs to sign their zones and then upload their keys to the top level domain registry. Um, so it's got a non-trivial cost to deploy and it's rather easy to get wrong and get unusual breakages because some clients validate DNSSEC data and others do not. Um, furthermore, DNSSEC uh, does not fit in UDP packet. I did mention that earlier, but the TCP IP connection teardown time is actually quite high and can add a latency of several seconds because it has to connect. It may have to connect to multiple servers in sequence to validate a set of keys, depending on how many level of delegations are there. Furthermore, the information is still sent in the clear. So even though now you've got authentication, you still don't have any privacy. Um, so, you know, swing and a miss. And it goes downhill from there. Um, because of the distributed nature of DNS, um, the design of DNSSEC actually does not have, you know, ha has the recursive resolver do all the validation. The end client doesn't see any of this unless it specifically goes asking for it. So basically, unless you're running a local DNS resolver, you cannot be sure that DNSSEC information is there being properly validated or, you know, is being acted on whatsoever. You just have to cross your fingers and hope. So basically in short, it gives us the ability to know that a record may be correct but it doesn't actually give us any security beyond that. There has been some work to rectify this in two competing standards, or I shouldn't say competing, they, they, they do solve two use cases, but that is DNS over TLS and DLS, uh, DNS over HTTPS. So let's talk about DNS over TLS first. So it's essentially the concept here is to use the industry standard TL, TLS protocol, which is also used by HTTPS and basically every other secure transaction on the internet to wrap DNS traffic and then just send the packets to or from like that. Um, the, as far as downsides go, there's quite a few. The most pra the, the biggest ones end users will run into is that many corporate firewalls will block non-HTTP uh, or non-HTTPS traffic and you still have the same uh, behavior of trusting the upstream server to do DNSSEC validation. 
Now, in response to the first bullet point came this protocol, DNS over HTTPS. This um, exists today in Chrome and in Firefox. Um, it basically encapsulates DNS requests inside HTTPS endpoints. And um, it would basically allow encryption of DNS traffic uh, in a situation where only basic web access is available. Both these technologies are available today. Uh, both Google and Cloudflare offer them, and it's available in some in several major DNS server packages. I, I cannot remember offhand if Bind has it, but I do know Power DNS does. But there are major problems with both these standards. And in some ways, you could even say that in, they may be fundamentally flawed. So the largest problem of DNS over TLS is it ties in the very complicated world of web PKI, that is certificate authorities um, and, uh, you know, and, use, and it, client certificates and so forth uh, into DNS. While this does prevent uh, passive wiretapping, um, that's a typo. Uh, the reality is that WebPKI prevents DOT from being effective as it is. The first major problem you have is that you can't get certificates for what's known as RFC 1918 space. That's the private IP space that most corporate and home networks use. That's 192.168, 10.0.0.0, and 172.168. So if you are on a private network, you cannot get a certificate for that address space and you'll have to either use a self-signed certificate or have your own certificate authority. So we've already got a major issue with securing traffic on private networks uh, with this standard. In general, it means that you, for most end users, you'll only be able to use DNS over TLS with public resolvers over the internet, such as cloud flares. And then it sort of get it, it, it actually gets worse. The large problem with web PKI is it depends on DNS to do what's known as revocation and status checks. Um, embedded inside every SSL certificate are known at what's known as ANA information, which basically says this is where you go to check my revocation status. This is how you know if a certificate is valid and has not been compromised. But because these standard, this um, TLS was never designed to be used with DNS, those all take the form of host names. Well, now you have a bootstrapping problem. You can't check the revocation status of your certificate without having DNS, and you don't know if your DNS uh, server has a valid certificate until you've done a DNS lookup. And oh, added bonus, if your DNS server is compromised, they can black hole the uh, resolver. Most TLS implementations will soft fail if it cannot get a revocation uh, back. This is part of a larger issue of security in WebPKI, uh, but DNS is also affected by this. Theoretically, it is possible to use OCSP stapling. This is a technique of embedding the revocation status into the TLS handshake. But as far as I could tell, I'm not clear. It's not clear that any client server today implements this. Although there's nothing disallowing it by spec. Um, finally, DOT doesn't actually solve the cache poisoning or the recursive resolver flat out lying. It is basically just DNS over TLS. So you have all the problems with DNS. You've just basically stopped passive wiretapping, and even then. There's a question mark there because there are enough edge cases that, you know, if a client decides to accept a self-signed certificate, you might be able to completely sidestep that. So with that in mind, then we take a look at DNS over HTTPS, which inherits almost all the flaws of DOT and then adds more. Um, I'm really not a big fan of this spec. The largest problem I have with it is DNS over HTTPS allows browser JavaScript code to make arbitrary DNS lookups. Now, in theory, this has been touted as a major advancement for browser-based JavaScript. You know, they have much more power and flexibility. But I see it as a mechanism where now the browser has a way, you know, server Java, you know, 
JavaScript running on your browser now is a way that you can create a tracking cookie over DNS that's really hard to detect because it won't show up as a separate connection. Instead, it's a DNS request sent in wire. And these sort of types of DNS tracking has been done before, but now you've got a way that it's not going to show up as a separate connection when you look in Wireshark or an IDS. So short of basically adding minimalist opportunistic encryption, these standards don't actually add any realistic security to DNS data. You know, furthermore, given the fact that there's no standard saying that information should be DNS sec information should be available, um, it just gets pretty depressing overall. If there was a mechanism similar to HSTS, and for those unaware, HSTS is basically a mechanism for websites to say, you are to connect to me over secure socket only. Um, it would help solve this issue, but it would have an inherent risk of trust on first use. Then again, that's still considerably better than the world we live in right now. Um, the other issue that we run into is that there have been efforts to create what's known as stapled DNSSEC. Uh, the concept here is that the a server can collect its own DNSSEC chain and send it to the client for validation. Uh, and this got as far as drafting within the IFTF, and then it stalled out due to lack of support. Uh, I am hoping to see it come back at some point because it would open um, a world where we can realistically get DNSSEC client data to the client where it would be actually useful without a massive performance penalty. So, and basically, you still have all this problem with server-side validation of DNSSEC records it, it basically doesn't solve any real world problems. So with that in mind, there is one thing you can do to help protect yourself, and that is to do client side validation of DNSSEC. Um, there are packages and libraries available that will do this, such as DNSSEC trigger. It will download the RSIG records directly, run the validation, and sure no good results. Now, obviously, this is still subject to port 53 not getting tampered results, but it's a major step of security if you want to ensure that the DNS information you're receiving is correct. So um, granted at a performance penalty due to the fact that you have to open multiple TCP IP connections if you have cold caches. So with that in mind, despite being a core internet protocol, DNS cannot be trusted to provide accurate information due to man in the middle attacks done by both ISPs and other attackers, and as well as the form of DNS cache poisoning and other types of traffic manipulation. You can use DOH and DOT to provide encryption and prevent eavesdropping, but they don't prevent man in the middle attacks. And for private lands, it's either impossible to deploy or requires you to set up an incredibly large amount of infrastructure. So if you need secure DNS, the only information, uh, sorry, the only option you have is to hope the service you connect to provide DNS sec information and that you're not having resolvers that strip it from you. Quite a few home routers, if you request DNS sec information, will actually fail to return it. I've seen this in DNS mask and quite a few routers from um, Linksys. So it's a problem I have seen in the wild. So, and with this in mind, I've started doing research into the actual DNS hijacking. And to that end, I wrote a utility called DNS Catcher. Now, DNS Catcher is still in, it's basically in proof of concept stage. I proved that I can be done. I still have to flesh it out to be more useful. But DNS Catcher, it's written in ADA and it run, currently runs as a DNS server and it then does A-B testing of the data provided to it. So given a DNS result, it will check with a recursive resolver and then it'll check against what it calls the trusted resolver, which in my case is generally Cloudflare, and sees if those two answers match. For example, if I try it on my home ISP, I get mismatches because uh, my ISP hijacks um, domain not found errors. So the theory is that we can catch discrepancies between local DNS data and what's published in the root. And DNS Catcher 
um, is has gained the ability to go to the root zone, request records, and then be recursively walk the chain to build an affordive, um to know what the affordive record should be. Um, is it's still an early alpha, but the source code is available. Um, and I am actively seeking funding to develop and flesh it out further to make it a useful security tool. It is the intent of DNS Catch to provide a standard API for cross-checking DNS records from a client uh, with hopes to integrate it into specialized tools like uh, Oni Probe to see if DNS data is accurate and to also help provide a detailed cross-section of, detail, uh, of DNS hijacking across the internet. Um, as it currently exists right now, it does support the full DNS protocol over UDP. Um, TCP support is incomplete because there are some wire changes I just haven't coded in, but it can successfully perform the cross check and um, log them to a file. Um, currently, the next step in the process is to build support of logging this information in database, proper caching of TTLs, and being able to import what's known as um, zone file data. Basically, ICANN allows you to download zone files for all the top level domains and then be able to import them directly into the database. Um, so you have a much more complete picture of what the record should be versus having to go out and ask each time. Uh, Catcher is licensed under the two clause MIT license and it's free and open source software. Uh, contributions are welcome if anyone wants to jump in and help me with it. So um, at this point, any questions? Uh, first of all, thank you, Michael. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. All right. So are there any questions? I'll pass the mic to anyone who has any. If there are no questions right now, I have a quick question. Um, for the people who might have heard this in-depth walkthrough of DNS here for the first time, could you briefly describe some real-world attack scenarios, perhaps some that are mitigated by DNS over HTTPS or DNS over TLS, and some that are not? As far as real-world scenarios, um, there have been cases where Amazon uh, S3 has been targeted to um, by DNS hijacking. What the attacker generally does is they put in a proxy server between them and Amazon and then use um, HTTPS to, uh, they basically just tunnel through. They may not be able to see the traffic in flight, but they can still get a log of everyone who's connecting to it and going through. Um, this has also been used for, um, D DNS attacks have also been used by the Great Firewall of China to block websites as well as being used in the United Kingdom for court-ordered um, website blocking. DNS over TLS and DNS over HTTPS can help get around those types of blocks, assuming the connection in and of itself isn't blocked by a firewall. Um, in that case, DNS over HTTPS has a better chance of succeeding since it looks like a normal HTTPS um, session but um, it's still blockable because if you know where those servers are out in the wild. Does that help? Yep, I'll have a question as well. So you mentioned that there's no H H HSTS for DNS. How about the DNS over HTTPS? Doesn't, ha doesn't that one have it? No, it doesn't. Um, DNS over HTTPS is only on port 443. It never downgrades to port 80. But it doesn't say that the DNS zones are signed with DNS sec data. There's nothing, there's no bit or field or record that says these zones are signed for X period of time. So DNS over HTTPS and DNS over TLS provide no changes to the protocol from stock DNS and provide no additional security from that perspective. Okay, I see. 